Senator Cooper? Here. Senator French? Here. Senator Cole? Present. Senator Koss? Here. Chairwoman Nethercott? Here. Well, good morning, everyone. I apologize for the late start. We're a few minutes late on this cold, snowy morning of the Wednesday, the last day for bills to come out of committee for the Senate. Um, it's good to see all the bill sponsors here this morning. We're going to go ahead and get started with Senate File 85, Child Care Facilities Certification Exemption. The good Senator Perkins is here before us. Senator Perkins, welcome to Senate Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's good to be here. Um, Madam Chairman, I bring for your consideration today, Senate File, Senate File 85, Child Care Facility Exemption Certification. I think it's a it's a I think it's a really quick and, and pretty simple bill. I'll, if I can just explain very quickly the need, what you have when you go to uh, uh, Title 14 and particularly Title 14 for child care facilities, um, 14 for 102 list certification exception exceptions to certification requirements for child care facilities. Uh, entities such as the, the Boys and Girls Club, um, YMCA. We have a lot of regional, uh, a lot of regional and community groups have developed after-school programs and youth development programs that are all throughout the state, from from Ranchester to Evanston, from Cheyenne to Cody, and and what they've done over the years. If you go to fourteen four one zero two, they've been exempted from license over the years under fourteen four one zero B Romanet seven, which is ranches or farms not offering services to children who are homeless, delinquent, or have intellectual disability and summer camp. So they've either, they've kind of been shoehorning under that. As, as federal money's increased, there's been increased scrutiny on that. And, and the division has become increasingly concerned about these types of things. And it's come to the point where they either need a license or we need to create an exemption from licensing. The reasons why the, one of the reasons why these have been long time exempted because they, they, they don't provide care for infants and they, they're after their school age children. So what has, and working with the director, um, we came up with this language that uh, seems to be very acceptable, and that's what you have in the bill. It's very simple. It creates this new exemption that after school programs that operate primarily when school is not in session, including before and after school and during summer months, exclusively serve children required to attend school under the, the appropriate law, under Wyoming law, and are organized to promote childhood learning, child and youth development educational enrichment, education, edu recreational or other character building activities and adhere to applicable local health, safety and fire codes. So what this does, it takes them out of the inspection and licensing purview of the Department of Family Services, but it does mean that they have to do, they, they will have to comply with local health care codes, local fire codes, local other codes and be subject to by uh, subject to inspection um, by fire police and uh, local health care agencies and items like that. Again, this is these provide uh, the fact these are the these when you combine them together, they're the last the, the largest after school care and summer care providers for children. And uh, and I believe this is relatively non controversial, but you never know, Madam Chairman. And so that's the bill. That's what it does. And would stand for questions. Thank you, Senator Perkins. Questions for the senator. Uh, senator Cole. <laughs> Good morning, Senator Perkins. Good morning. Uh, particularly on page two, uh, line uh, two, and I, I just wondered why uh, operate primarily was, was in there. Is that does it have to be in there for some other purpose? I just wondered about the. Uh, you know, it seems to be a little uh, kind of a squishy language. I, I use the uh, legal term of art. <laughs> Is it squishy, Senator Perkins? It's. Uh, I, you know, we if someone from the department is here, we I work with the director on this language, this language that she proffered, uh, and working with her. She's this director has always been great in working with this, and she's we've talked about this problem numerous times over the years. Um, but ultimately, what you're trying to do is you're not trying to to allow people shoot uh, uh, other forms of schools or other things to shoehorn in. This is this is after these are after school programs primarily. About the only exception to that is speaking of the director, here she is, and I'll let her answer that question. <laughs> Always a good decision. Good morning, director. Good to see you. Thank you, Chairwoman Nethercott, members of the committee. My name is Corin Schmidt, and I'm the director of the Department of Family Services. And good morning to 
Chairman Perkins. Um, primarily, yes, it is a little squishy, but not all um, after school programs, not all school districts work in the same schedule. So to be able to give some flexibility that says primarily because of alternating school schedules, it just gives a little bit of cushion. I mean, I, we could maybe better define it and say specifically when school is in session, but um, what we did learn under COVID is that there's so much variableness in when schools are operating versus when after school programs are operating, et cetera, that this just gives some flexibility. Um, Follow up. I, so you feel comfortable with that language? That was is your opinion? Madam Chairwoman, Senator Cold, yes, we're comfortable with it. Thank you. And Director, if we can, we'll just go ahead and switch to you for any comments you have on the bill. Sounds like the good Senator consulted your department um, on the bill. You wanna to speak to that? Um, Madam Chairwoman, we have no concerns with the bill. We were actually relieved to have this conversation. As um, Chairman Perkins mentioned, this has been kind of an old issue that just as we've refined our after school programming and the way that kids are taken care of outside of the home, that this made sense and it was really long overdue. All right, questions for the director. All right, seeing none, thank you both. Any further public comment on this bill? Yep, please come forward. Good morning, if you would introduce yourself to the committee and who you're with and then share with us your comments. Anderson. Oh. My name is Ryan Anderson. I'm representing Youth Emergency Services in Gillette and what Wyoming Youth Services Association. And I would just like to speak in, in support of this bill. Um, it, it affects, you know, other, other after school and before school providers, you know, with um, Wyoming Youth Services Association members and, and people who are providing enrichment and pro, for programs for youth um, school aged across the state. All right, thank you. Any questions? Well, thanks for being here. Did you drive right. down from Gillette? Not today. <laughs> uh, glad to yeah. hear that safe travels home. Thank you so much. You. All right, any further public comment on the bill? All right, seeing none, public comment is closed. Uh, committee, back to you. Move Moved by cost, yeah. seconded by Cooper. Discussion on the bill? Seeing none, roll call on the bill. Senator Cooper. Hi. Senator French. Aye. Senator Cole. Aye. Senator Cost. Aye. And Chairwoman Nethercott. Aye. Madam Chair, Senate Bill 85 passes with five eyes. You're welcome. All right. With that, we'll move on to Senate File 77. I see Senator Ellis is here. And for members of the public, you've seen um, a change from the bill listing. Uh, from what was originally listed on the agenda, we're accommodating some sponsors um, in their busy schedules. There's multiple committee hearings and many legislators have to be in different places at once. So you'll see that. So we're gonna go with Senate file 77, Senate file 100, and then Senate file 41. And then last for the day, Senate file 65. Um, so we'll try to get through these most quickly, recognizing we have a busy schedule, but that's the plan for this morning. With that, Senator Ellis, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate you accommodating my schedule. I need to run back to Senate education. So thank you for understanding that. Um, Senate file 77 is a really straightforward bill. Um, if you see, uh, we have some residency requirements for individuals who wanna change their name. I was approached last year by a woman who had moved to Wyoming to escape um, and try and start a new life after having been married to a very abusive husband. I believe she was able to restore her maiden name, but she wanted an entirely new name altogether. So she looked at the requirements of what that would take in Wyoming, and we require that an individual live two years in the county um, where before being able to petition a court. This woman um, had an opportunity. She needed to leave Cheyenne. She's still in Wyoming, but um, she moved to Laramie, I believe. And so um, sadly, the clocks for her starts all over again. So she will have lived nearly in Wyoming for four years before she's able to ask for a name change. In doing some research on this bill, I found a website that had compiled, um, you know, what the residency requirements were for um, name changes and found that 38 states have no specific residency requirement. Of the states that do, most require six months or less. And so um, it just seemed reasonable uh, for us to 
maybe look at this. And so if you were to open your green books and look at 1-25-102 under the history section of your green books, you'll see laws 1890-91. So I think that Mr. Madam Chair, that this has been on the books for, since statehood. A lot has changed since then. We're a much more mobile society. We have tools like social security numbers. Um, my guess is that when we became a state, this residency requirement was so that an individual would, couldn't evade law enforcement or creditors or, or have some kind of nefarious reason for trying to change their name. Um, but we're just out of step with what how other states handle residency when it comes to name changes. So um, as I mentioned, when I introduced this bill on the floor, um, I picked 60 days, but certainly open to any, you know, the will of this committee, the will of the body on the floor. Um, you know, we uh, Chairwoman Nethercott and I have talked about maybe six months in the state. So I'm uh, very open to amendments that you might have, but I do think that this is important. So with that, it's a pretty straightforward little bill. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Senator Ellis. Questions for the Senator? All right, seeing none, thank you. Uh, Senator Kolb, question? Thank you, Madam Chairman. The uh, Senator Ellis, uh, the, the the draft drastic change from two years to sixty days. I mean, I I'm, I have some hesitancy about that much of a change. I mean, I I think you're correct. Things have changed and things are more mobile. But is there an issue with going to six months, or what? What is your thoughts about that? I mean, how? What? What? Do you, what what's your opinion about that? I'm just concerned that. Uh, People will just use will abuse this. I think you you gave a good legitimate point on why it needs to be changed. But what would be your opinion about going to six months or some other number besides uh, the, the sixty days? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Kolb. Um, so as I mentioned, thirty eight states have no residency requirement that I'm aware of. Um, of the states that do, it's six months or less, and I think that those are eight states that have that. Um, there are a few states that are 30 days and some that have 60. I pick 60 knowing that um, there might be folks like you who say, I want six months. And so a little bit of a negotiation, to, I want to start on the low point. I started on the low point just because I think that, um, you know, the statute, if you read 1-25101, that sets forth some of the other requirements that the petitioner has to explain to the court, the reason for seeking a name change. And the courts only order them if they're satisfied that the desired change is proper and not detri detrimental to the interest of any other person. And so this isn't a sidestep for anyone. Um, they still need to tell the court why do they want their name changed um, and show that it, it won't be detrimental to anyone else. Um, along those lines, uh, you know, there are other provisions in this part of the statute. There are some um, elements if you wanted your confidentiality, you know, right now there's a publication requirement. I don't want to change any of that. You know, if certain individuals qualify for, you know, confidentiality, this doesn't touch this. This just says you can petition the court sooner um, rather than later. Senator French. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator, um, do you have a idea how many people would fall under this in the state in a year's time would uh, petition for a name change? Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator French. No, I don't. Um, I did think about calling each court to ask how many name changes they process each year. And at the end of the day, I didn't know that that would add a ton of value to this discussion. Um, you know, if a court docket's long and this, I don't think that that changes it. They just are able to get in line sooner. Um, I will tell you that in visiting with um, House members um, that I have agreed to co-sponsor a number of the attorneys on that list have talked about clients that they've been um, representing who, um, and I'm sure you'll hear more about this if you visit with them, but there are a variety of reasons. Uh, there was one individual, um, a client of one of the co-sponsors on the House side who explained that um, he did not have a close attachment to his biological father. He was older than 18 um, and his mother had remarried and her new husband really was a father figure to him. So to honor his father, this new man in his life, he wanted to change his name, but um, you know, is fairly new to the state and so was barred from doing it for two years. So I think that this will help very, you know, a small number of individuals. I don't think the number's terribly large. Thank you, Senator. All right, further public comment? All right. Are you sure? Going once, going twice. A little sensitive to this right now. Public comment is closed. Uh, senators, back to you. Moved by Senator Koss, seconded by Senator Cooper. 
Is there an amendment? Senator, I have an amendment. Uh, senators on page one, line 13, to change the provision from 60 days to six months. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Senator Cole. Discussion? Uh, yes, may I ask a question, please? Senator Cost. Madam Chair, is that six months in the state or six months in the county? That's gonna be the second amendment in the state. Okay, thank you. So um, further discussion on the amendment, questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion has passed. The second amendment is changing the location. Um, so on page 12. I mean line 12? I'm sorry, page one, line 12. Change county to state. I will second that. Seconded by cost. Further discussion? Question. Question being called. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion has passed. Further discussion on the bill? Question. Seeing none, roll call. <coughs> Senator Cooper. Aye. Senator French. Aye. Senator Cole. Aye. Senator Cost. Aye. Chairwoman Nethercott. Aye. Madam Chair, uh, Senate File 77 passes as amended. All right, thank you. With that, we will move right along. The time is 8.22. We have three more bills to get through, um, just so that the public is aware for what this looks like. I'm, um, so remember, the public comment needs to be afforded. We have really about an hour and 15 minutes to work the additional bills. The time is 8.22. Senate File 100, Stocking Amendments. Senator Landon, welcome to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Madam Chairman, thank you. Uh, I wanna thank the committee for uh, bringing Senate File 100 to the Judiciary Committee and thank you for your support uh, upon introduction. Uh, this is uh, frankly a moving target and um, what this bill represents I think is, um, is an ongoing effort um, that you have actually um, helped to lead over the last four or five years and a section of law that I think needs our attention. Um, we, we have gained some ground and passed some meaningful legislation a couple of years ago. Uh, in my view, um, it deserves another look and, and it, it goes into an area um, of law that, uh, that frankly is changing a little bit because of uh, the advancement in technology and uh, the ability for uh, people to obtain devices that that can be used in a nefarious way. Um, Madam Chairman, uh, I think it sometimes helps to give a little bit of background as to why there's a little bit of passion for a bill. I, during my days in the Dean of Students office at a college up in the center part of the state, uh, this is actually a, uh, a crime that I ran into quite a little bit. Um, not just students, uh, but faculty and staff. Um, in one particular case, a, a staff member uh, ran into a difficult situation where uh, she was stalked. A um, little bit different uh, section of the law uh, requires three different times that you have to report such a situation. It took a break in at her, at her apartment before she was able to get a uh, protective order. Um, so this is around. It's interesting to me that uh, one out of six women, by the time they reach the age of 25 years old, um, have been stalked. Uh, in the year 2019, 3.4 million people were stalked in the United States. 70% um, of those who were surveyed said they feared for their lives. Um, so this, uh, this bill, Senate File 100, Madam Chairman, takes us into... Uh, into the crimes and offenses statutes and all the way to Article 5, Assault and Battery. Um, I'll, I'll walk you through the bill real quickly. I'll, I'll expedite my comments this morning because I know you have a lot on the plate. Um, we go down to 62506 at the bottom of page one. Uh, paragraph B, unless otherwise provided by law, a person commits the crime of stalking if with the intent to harass another person the person engages in a course of conduct reasonably likely to harass that person, including 
but not limited to any of the combination of the following. And uh, what this bill would do is add paragraph four using any electronic, digital, or global positioning system device to place another person under surveillance or to surveil another person's internet or wireless activity without authorization from the other person. That is the extent of the bill, Madam Chairman. Um, again, that tries to get at, at, um, at what's literally going on out there. We think this is an area of law that, um, that unfortunately is, is growing uh, in numbers. Um, devices are easy to obtain. Uh, you can literally go online and uh, obtain these devices. We had a situation up in our neck of the woods uh, where um, our sheriff's department found three different devices on one car. Um, but we have the experts here with us, Madam Chairman. So I'm going to allow for that testimony if you so desire and uh, kind of shut it off right there. Um, so that's the bill. Uh, and uh, hope you can support it. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kolb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Senator Lannon. Good uh, morning. Specifically on the bill, uh, page two, uh, line 16, where it goes into talking about otherwise engaging in a course of conduct that harasses another person. That uh, seems to include an awful lot of things there, uh, number one. And then more importantly, uh, Senator, uh, I, I think this is becoming a larger problem. I am afraid always of getting somebody who didn't have nefarious reasons for what they were doing, but got caught up into this language. And could you do something to reassure me that that uh, wouldn't happen? Senator? Madam Chairman, Senator Kolb, you know, I think that is the issue and that's, that's, um, uh, that really comes down to why we work so hard to get this language right and, and to move carefully. Uh, that is why we have those in the legal profession who uh, not only are aware of that kind of situation, but are <clears throat> very necessary to support people in situations like that. Um, I actually found it interesting, Senator, uh, as I was doing some homework for this bill, there are two different legal sites right here in the state of Wyoming, one of which says, this is already covered and it's already illegal to surveil somebody with an electronic device. But another um, from another uh, legal firm said, no, it's not covered. It's not covered uh, because we do not explicitly in our laws state that we don't want you surveilling somebody with an electronic device. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I, I just felt compelled with this bill that um, that it was time for us to uh, bring ourselves into this century with the, with the the language that says no we do not want you to uh, utilize these electronic devices to do this to people um, the language is tricky and it's it's something that I really uh, look forward to your discussion and as we work this bill um, very amenable to to better language, but um, I think it's important that we get it in there. Hope that answers your question. All right, thank you, Senator. Uh, further questions from the committee? Senator Cooper's ready on the button though. All right. <laughs> All right, we do, you know, there is time. So if you do have questions, feel free to ask. Don't wanna hustle anybody, but we're short on time, but if Senator Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Landon, um, on my phone here today, I can I can uh, pull up an app that came with my vehicle, and I can tell you exactly where my vehicle is, or any vehicle I own. Um, it's it's built into the vehicle. It's built into the app that I use to start my vehicle. Now, how do we? How does that apply? It's with your consent, Senator Cooper. I would recommend you disable those apps. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Madam Chairman, uh, Senator Landon, Senator Cooper, that that's absolutely takes us right to the, to where this bill goes, and um, it's it's absolutely amazing um, the availability of certain apps. Um, I discovered that for fifty dollars, I can buy an app, which uh, allows me to send your emails to people, and I can do that right now, and. If we don't specifically say that that's against the law, it's a little bit tougher for the legal profession to, to write in and, um, and prosecute. I, uh, that's a great question. This, this is a tough area of law. And um, with, with your help on the Judiciary Committee, I hope that we can get this little piece right and uh, continue on. I think I've even talked with the, the chairman uh, about the fact that this whole section of law probably could use another look every two years. I mean, every every so often, uh, because things are changing pretty dramatically. It's pretty amazing what technology can do now. It's also because Senator Landon brings a stocking bill every other year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Madam Chairman, I forgot to mention, I, I, I did uh, send down a note that um, uh, provided to us by our National Association, which helps everybody to understand Wyoming is not the only state dealing with this. Uh, there are 18 other states out there uh, literally dealing with this issue right now, uh, trying to land things in the right spot. This language, um, uh, we like the language that was utilized in a state, two states to the south of us. And uh, this is very similar to what that state chose to pass. Um, that is not to say that that it fits in Wyoming, but it is to just say, you know, we're not the only ones dealing with this. Um, it's um, it, it, it's a tough it, it's a tough area of law that's changing dramatically every day, as Senator Cooper pointed out. Further questions from the committee? All right, just for a point of clarification as well. Uh, senators on page two, line 16 through 17, what, what Senator Cole pointed out, that language is already in law. And so the only new language is um, lines 10 through 14 for those following along. So Madam Chairman, thank you for that clarification. I, I, um, I did develop a proposed amendment at the request of, of a wonderful group up in Natrona County who has worked in this area for quite some time. Um, it is only for your consideration. Uh, that is entirely up to the committee as to whether or not you want to uh, consider that. Uh, but I, I hope that that was passed out this morning. Mm -hmm. um, we, do, um, we do have one of those experts um, on, uh, on the Zoom this morning um, from, from the Sheriff's Department. And we have other, other experts uh, behind me who can um, enlighten as well. But you do have that in front of you for consideration. Thank you, Senator. Thanks. All right. How many people do we have on Zoom? And the chairman doesn't know either when there's people on Zoom who intends to testify on what bill or if they even intend to testify on a bill or how many show up to testify on Zoom, just a point of clarity as well. So for those on Zoom that wish to testify on this bill, if you could raise your electronic hand right now, We have one, Madam Chairman. All right, if we could bring that person in. And meanwhile, um, Ms. Muir, I anticipate you want to testify on this bill. If you could please come forward. So while we wait for that individual to come in, because there's that delay, we'll go ahead and flip to Ms. Muir. Welcome, Ms. Muir. Good morning, Chairman Nethercott. And committee members, my name is Tara Muir. I'm the public policy director with the Wyoming Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. We work very closely with um, over 23 crisis programs, domestic violence shelters across the state. We talk to victims every day, especially all the advocates with boots on the ground, for lack of a better word. This situation came to our attention through a very small town uh, on the eastern corner. Um, that their law enforcement did not feel they had clear enough language in the stalking statute 
um, to press any charges against a person who admitted there was a device, but it could not be found. Uh, I don't have all the particulars of how the case finally uh, came out. Um, the person on Zoom, hopefully, is Sergeant Taylor Courtney from Natrona County, who wants to talk about the amendment and what they're really seeing a lot of cases of this in Natrona County. It is across the state as well. Um, what we know is too often the stalking happens with the intent to harass, intent to scare. Um, usually all that behavior happens before sexual assault happens. They're tracking people down. They're trying to find the best opportunity to rape them. So we wanna stop this behavior. In domestic violence, it usually happens after. The ex-intimate partner just can't seem to let go. And there's a lot of fear. It's um, one of the scourges of these kinds of crimes. It's not just a simple assault or a simple rape ever. Usually there's a history going up and a history going after. Um, with that, I'm happy to stand for questions, but we support this bill 100%. The amendment, uh, the four words will help not just the placing of a device, but nobody even needs to leave their apartment and they can hack into other people's Gmails or iCloud accounts and really wreak havoc just letting that victim know I can get to you and I can send emails in your name. I can ask your grandparents how you're doing and they think it's you. Um, so we are 100% for this. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Ms. Muir. Questions for Ms. Muir? All right. Um, Deputy Courtney. Taylor, Courtney, Courtney Taylor. Taylor. Yeah. Madam Chairwoman, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good to see you again to the Judiciary Committee. Good morning. Well, it's nice to see you as well. Go ahead and prepare your statements. If you could introduce yourself, I believe you're with the Natrona County Sheriff's Department. And Yes, Madam Chairwoman um, uh, and members of the committee. My name is Taylor Courtney. I am the Investigation Sergeant with the Natrona County Sheriff's Office. Uh, this is my 18th year in law enforcement. Uh, more than half of my career has been dedicated to the field of investigations and uh, stalking is a passion and something that I would consider a, a specialty of mine. Um, this, this isn't our, our first go around with uh, stalking uh, amendments. However, I think this one is probably one of the most germane. And the reason why is because stalking does not look like it used to look. Uh, placing a person under surveillance, physical surveillance, is something that is pretty rare these days. Um, now, what we have is we have a cell phone. We have an iPhone. We have an Android. Some of us have multiple devices. We have tablets. We have computers. Um, stalkers generally, and what we're seeing and what's going on is they are accessing those accounts. The majority of stalking occurs from an intimate partner relationship. And through that, all you have to have, uh, members of the committee, I'm, you have a phone. And if that's an iPhone, you have an iCloud account. And if somebody you're in a, in a relationship with knows your email address to that iCloud account and the password, they have access to every single application that is on your phone. So much as Senator Cooper said that he was talking about his, his car. If I had access to his cloud account, whether that be Google or whether that be iCloud or Apple, I could hack in there and I could start his vehicle. I could fo follow him and see where he's going. Um, these devices have GPSs in them that can track you within three feet of your location at almost any given point in time. I have not seen a case in the last three years that does not include this type of behavior. So the way that I see uh, Senate File 100 is that we are not redefining stocking here we are establishing the venue in which it takes place in 2022. Um, just as an example, um, I just recently worked a case and here's the file from it, if you can see how big that is. This is digital communication. There were uh, over 100,000 artifacts located on the stalker cell phone that were related to his, his stalking of, of the victim. And in that, we, at, we were able to find through a search warrant of his cell phone that he had hacked into her Netflix account, her college account. He had her financials. He had her banking information. Um, he had her mother's pin code to unlock the door to her vehicle. Um, GPS tracking devices. If you didn't want to do it through a phone, this is how big they are right here. They're this small and 
you can attach that anywhere. If you can get access to somebody's cell phone, you have access to their entire life these days. So it's really important that we have language that clearly defines the venue in which stalking is taking place through the electronic digital means through wireless or internet activity, because that is predominantly, it, it is a germane issue in every single case that, that we are working up here. And we have a lot of them. There is a need for um, properly identifying this, like I said, and establishing the venue in which it's taking place. So I could go on for hours about this, but I know your time is, is limited, so I will not. Um, but I will stand for any questions that you have. Um, I can answer some of those questions um, that have previously come up of, of uh, how exactly this works. Thank you, Sergeant Courtney. Questions, Senator Kolb? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good day, Sergeant Courtney. I just had a question. This is, I mean, obviously horrific, the, uh, the things that are going on here. But are you unable to prosecute under Romanet uh, 5, uh, otherwise engaging in a course of conduct that harasses another person? Or has that been a problem uh, for you to prosecute without having this new language? Thank Sergeant. you, sir. Yeah, Sergeant. Uh, Senator Cole, uh, man, uh, Madam Chairwoman, um, we in Natrona County are, are not experiencing some of the issues that some of the, the smaller jurisdictions are. And, and I would attribute that to, we have a larger exposure of stalking cases that are happening. So our, our district attorney's office up here sees this on a fairly regular basis. So although we are able to get some of these cases prosecuted, um, it, it typically has to be severe. Again, we have to, here's a misdemeanor case that's, that's taken me two months to work. And I would venture to say that that would not be um, as difficult to do um, with this Senate File 100, with this bill going forward, if it becomes part of law um, under this statute. Um, I know many other uh, professional colleagues around the state are having issues with getting cases prosecuted. And again, I attribute that to a lack of exposure. Sergeant Courtney, based on the facts that you've shared with us, is there any other crimes that that suspect would qualify of potentially being charged with? Well, we look at, um, um, Madam Chairwoman, excuse me for my manners. Um, you know, we would look at identity theft, right? Um, but identity theft requires an intent to defraud. And that's not the intent of a stalker. And a stalker, a stalker is obsessive. They are coercive. They're trying to compel action or inaction and instill fear to get what they want. Um, and that is not the purpose behind the identity theft statute. So really, we run into a, 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 an area where there is not an appropriate statute to charge. This should be the appropriate statute. We just need this language in here to establish that venue. Sergeant Courtney, is that the only other crime that you're aware of that might fit these facts? Madam Chairwoman, that would be dependent on, on the case at hand. Um, there could be, if there is a protection order in place, um, obviously that can enhance stalking to a felony, but you could also have a violation of a protection order, which would be a misdemeanor. So there are other crimes, but they are not the most appropriate way of handling these situations, in my opinion. And Sergeant Courtney, do you believe that there should be, is there a first time felony stalking crime in Wyoming? Madam Chairwoman, yes, there is. If there is a uh, protection order, whether it's one of any of the three, domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking in place, if it's an ex parte or a full order does not matter. But if that stalker engages in a course of conduct with the intent to harass as defined by our stalking statute while the protection order is in place, then that would be a first time felony. Um, however, typically in my experience, stalking has been going on in order to obtain the protection order if it's a, if it's a stalking protection order. All right, thank you, Sergeant Courtney. All right, thank you both. Further public comment on this bill? Yes, Mr. Odekoven. Thank you, Madam Chair. Byron Odekoven, the Executive Director with Wyoming Sheriffs and Chiefs. Let me rise in support of the bill and provide a degree of clarity to a question that was posed in two different ways uh, as to kind of how this would fit. So I think it's important for us to look at the existing statute 
section B on page one, line 14, as we talk about a person commits a crime of stalking if with intent to harass another person. And the paragraph continues on. So I think that is the premise you have to look at when you then look to the new language. So it's stalking if with intent to harass. So the question was the inadvertent, the use of the, of the vehicle or something else, that inadvertent usage would not fit the crime of stalking because they didn't with intent to do the crime as listed by then using the electronic means, digital or global positioning system device to place another person under surveillance or to surveil another person's internet or wireless activity without authorization. So there's several pieces to the statute that provide that uh, insurance that the person that we're dealing with, that we look to charge and look to prosecute has gone to great lengths to commit the crime. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Questions for Mr. Odekoven? All right, seeing none, thank you. Further public comment on this bill? Anyone else online? All right. No, seeing none, public comment is closed. Betty, back to you. Moved by Senator Cost, seconded by Senator Cooper. Committee members, do you wanna move uh, Senator Landon's amendment? Senator Cost would like to move the amendment. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Cole. Further discussion? You have that amendment. Question being called, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that amendment has passed. Further discussion on the bill? Senator Kolb. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I propose an amendment, um, page two, line 10. I don't know how to say this correctly, after Romanet or, or IV, uh, insert the word knowingly. No, that wouldn't help. Senator Kolb, great discussion, particularly based on our conversation yesterday. Um, the reality is, is if you go look at all of our crimes in Title VI, they don't distinguish that particular type of demarcation of mens rea. Um, some point in the future, we'll do a law school for lawyers or a, <laughs> well, 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 the Supreme Court has a program for, you know, lawmaking for legislators and how, kind of how some of those laws work um, to kind of understand the breakdown of the criminal code in that way. Sometimes the struggle is real for me um, <laughs> on that front. <laughs> Only with my lead yesterday. I know, I know, and uh, compromise is important. So um, I would refrain from adding that in this particular bill draft. I'd, I'd withdraw my motion for an amendment. All right, with that, roll call vote. Senator Cooper. Aye. Senator French. Aye. Senator Cole. Aye. Senator Cost. Aye. Chairwoman Nethercott. Aye. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, Senate Bill 100 passes as amended. All right, thank you. With that, we'll move to Senate File 41, expanding Next Generation 911. The sponsor of that is Senator Cost. Senator Cost, I think for time purposes, we'll just keep you up here if we can. Typically, we'd have you go down to the front, but just for time, let's get you going. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Senate File 41, we go from being able to stalk everybody to being able to have a difficult time trying to find people. So uh, the next generation 911 is uh, hopefully a new move that's gonna help us to alleviate some of those problems. Um, what this is, is updating the current statute of 911 to the next generation 911. Uh, which is called the Next Generation or NG911. <clears throat> there's a process that needed to be followed and I'm thankful there's, um, I was asked to lead this as uh, um, people involved with this in the state took it upon themselves to work on this and come up with the results. Uh, there were three things that were necessary for this to become um, uh, I guess a serious consideration. Uh, the requirements were first they needed a statewide coordinator and uh, 
Mr. Babbitt is that, and he's here today, and I'm very thankful of that because he'll help to correct anything that I'm errant upon. Um, then the second was they needed a plan for the NG911, and that's been completed and adopted. They also needed, um, the third was rulemaking authority uh, for 911 for the state. And um, that will allow uh, Mr. Babbitt to talk about a little bit. In the bill, if you go through, uh, this bill is following uh, 921102A uh, intro by creating new paragraphs. Those paragraphs are 18 and 19. And on uh, 921104A uh, by creating new paragraphs 8 and nine, and then on 169105B are amended to read. So we start out the commission composition, appointment of members, removal, terms of offices and vacancies. Uh, the commission shall consist of, this was changed to 13 voting members to be appointed by the governor who may be removed by the governor as provided in 91202. Uh, the director of Wyoming Department of Transportation or his designee shall serve as an ex uh, officio non-voting member of the commission. The director asked that we please remove this because he said we have representation on the committee, so we saw no reason to have that in there. Um, the uh, voting members shall be appointed from each of the following associations from their membership. Uh, and then it goes through and lists as the different areas where those memberships will come from. Um, 921104, Commission Powers and Duties. The Commission shall recommend guidelines for standards for the development, implementation, and operation of next generation 911 emergency communication systems and interoperable public safety communications and data systems in the state, including strategies for improving Wyoming's current 911 system. As part of the recommendations developed under this paragraph, the commission may identify short-term and long-term technological and policy solutions that integrate existing legacy communications in infrastructure into an in <clears throat> interoperable system and may develop and submit recommendations for legislation or other state action to further develop and support next generation 911 operations in Wyoming then promulgate necessary rules and regulations governing the next 911, uh, next generation 911 system operations and participation. And then on page four, you will see that they've inserted into 169105 um, on lines 11 and 12 and next generation 911 emergency communication system. So funds collected from the 911 emergency tax imposed pursuant to this act, this was already in there, uh, shall be spent solely to pay for public safety answering point and service suppliers. And so this just added not only the 911 that's currently there, but the next uh, generation 911. And then down below, you'll see that they've removed or in line 19 and uh, to maintain the computer database of public safety answering point and then on page five, integrate legacy communications infrastructure for 911 systems to uh, into interoperable next generation 911 emergency communication systems. So effectively what this is doing is this is setting up for the new next generation 911 so that we can adequately cover uh, and better triangulate uh, where people are located when a call is uh, phoned in. We've had incidences in uh, multiple parts of the state where location of a person has been misidentified through the stress of somebody calling. They may get a lane and a road turned around or a, a particular area misinterpreted and then all of a sudden we've got slow response and so this is to try to uh, facilitate that and have much more accurate uh, location of where people are calling from. And with that, I would stand to answer any questions or have Mr. Babbitt come forward and report any 
that he may have towards this as well. All right, thank you, Senator Cost. Are there questions for the sponsor, Senator Cost? Senator French. Uh, yeah, I'll probably uh, from a sponsor and the next individual. But on page four, uh, line five, B, funds collected from the 9-11 emergency tax imposed pursuant to this act. What funds and what rate of, uh, uh, of tax are we talking about? Because I know in Park County, when I was commissioner, we had our 911 system, and uh, I believe it was some state statute that we could collect 75 cents per device and uh, to go into our 911 fund. And we were in the process of, I think this is what this is talking about, of uh, advancing it. <clears throat> Somebody's hurt or whatever the deal is, and they call and the calls interrupted they can't and we were uh, they were uh, we were working towards triangulating that okay the calls interrupted they're not answering anymore they could go find them so can you expand on that and at that time we were worried there was rumors that because we had built our fund up because anytime you um do anything <laughs> with 911 is expensive and we had a pretty good fund built up and we'd buy uh, uh, equipment with that. And there was a rumor back then that the state was gonna take those funds that we had built up. And I don't know what happened there, but uh, that's some of the questions I've got. You ran for Senate, Commissioner French. <laughs> I'm out of the loop now. <laughs> now. That's what happened. That's why the state didn't take it. Senator Kolb. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I, a few general questions. Uh, the, the costs, uh, is this what some might call an unfunded mandate if they don't have enough revenue in the 911 fund? And then uh, phase, phase in time uh, for this program and just what would that be envisioned to be? And then ex if someone explained why we had to go from 11 to 13 members on the uh, Public Safety Communications Commission. Uh, those are some of the questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Should we... Go to Mr. Babbitt, welcome, please come forward. Is there anyone online that would like to speak to this bill? If you could raise your hand and we'll get them ready. Please proceed. Thank you, Ma Thank you Madam Chairman. Uh, Troy Babbitt, YDOT, Chief Technology Officer and appointed Governor's 911 Coordinator. Um, first of all, I'll jump right in and address the questions. The, the 75 cents is, is the current 911 line charge uh, associated with each, each individual's line charge, wireless or landline. That's where that collection point is. Um, Senator Cole, to the, to the cost amount, currently 911 fees uh, across the state are approximately $6 million with expenditures roughly double that at this point in time. Uh, as far as a phase, what this bill really uh, does is, is give the state of Wyoming the opportunity for the governance piece of it that's necessary for federal funding grants that we apply for. Once that's in place, we, as Senator Cost mentioned, you need a 911 coordinator, you need a state plan, and then finally you need a governance structure. Conversations across the state, it made sense to, to put this already in the Public Safety Communications Commission, add it to that uh, uh, commission, as well as the two additional uh, positions. It gives 911 finally a voice and a seat on, on the Public Safety Communications Commission, as well as it brings back Homeland Security onto that commission as well as critical partners. Senator French. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, sir, to answer my question, I, I maybe you did or I didn't. Know. Anyway, are those local funds left in the local communities that, that I spoke about, or are those being contemplated transferred to the state. Mr. Babbitt. Madam Chairman, uh, Senator French, they are local. That is correct, and it stays there. And they stay local, correct. Thank you. Senator Cole. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just to follow up on two extra members, so it's not necessary. You just are trying to get more of a voice for 911 on the, on the commission. Mr. Babbitt. Madam Chairman, Senator Cole, uh, in my opinion, they are necessary. Um, uh, without that voice, um, the 911 community is, is kind of left out of um, having a seat at the table. Follow up. Follow up. 
but if we if there's statutory changes that make this happen, then I, I I mean I understand about the representation, but to get to the point of enhanced 911, if that comes through a statutory requirement, then we don't need. I mean I don't I'm still a little baffled on why we need. It's it's an extra expense, all right. And I just was trying to justify that and to understand it. I think you helped me out with that. Ms. Mr. Madam Mr. Chairman, Senator Cole, you are correct. Uh, as far as far as the budgetary amount, it's it's pretty minimal uh, as far as the Department of Transportation's uh, commission cost on that. We we do have four quarterly meetings. Um, typically, we've with what we've all been through with COVID, we've, we've tried to do the majority of those remotely, but uh, it, a very minimal additional cost for two additional seats that would be key. Mr. Babbitt, it looks like on the fiscal note that the additional cost from the two additional members on the seat is approximately $3,500 a year. Is that correct? Madam Chairman, that is correct. All right, thank you. And just to kind of recap, Mr. Babbitt, from my understanding, um, really the genesis and the purpose of this bill is to allow for further access to grant and federal dollars as a result of meeting kind of those fundamental requirements to be eligible to apply for those funds by having an appropriate entity meeting some of those prerequisites to make that ask, is that correct? That is correct, Madam Chairman. Uh, in, in 2019, there was, there was 13 states and territories that were not able to apply for 911 grant opportunities, Wyoming being one of those. That's what started this, uh, looking forward to an opportunity. Next generation 911 is, is that next generation of IP, of everything you've talked about from video to images to texting, to high capacity broadband, to be able to be able to triangulate, pinpoint mobile phones, everything else that that next generation is necessary. Funding will work with the locals to, uh, the idea would be to disperse, to get them updated, upgraded, to, to be able to handle the capacity uh, of equipment that would be coming uh, and, and certainly work with all the locals for those upgrades. Mr. Babbitt, if this bill doesn't pass, what is the potential opportunity cost loss to the state of Wyoming. Madam Chairman, uh, just recently there was the BBB, the Build Back Better uh, fund that was stalled in the Senate on the federal side of the fence. That 911 bill was approximately $10 billion. And just a rough estimate, that would be approximately $10 million that could come to the state of Wyoming to help the infrastructure get upgraded. Thank you, Mr. Babbitt. Final questions for Mr. Babbitt. Senator French. Uh, Madam Chairman, I'll be, I'll be quick. Uh, yes, sir. Um, do you see any need for because this is expensive. <laughs> Back when I was in there, it was very expensive. Um, do you see any need to up that tax from 75 cents per device per month to a higher number? Mr. Babbitt? Madam Chairman, Senator French, I do believe that is uh, something that would probably be addressed next session. Senator Kolb? Uh, just one final question about the, the grant. Is there a match requirement for that federal money? Madam Chairman, Senator Kolb, in the past, there typically has been. Uh, the details on that are a little bit unclear as to where that match would come from. Senator Cost. I also, I'm on the broadband committee, and we've been working to make sure that we can uh, allocate some money from there to the use of uh, getting the equipment all free this so it'll be cheaper and it looks like through the funds from federal and all that we have there we'll be able to do some of that so that's the intent at this point senator cooper your lights on Pardon? green light sorry about that. <laughs> all right any final questions for mr babbitt mr babbitt thank you so much thank you. further public comment mr odakoven Thank you, Madam Chair, Byron Odikoven, Executive Director for the Wyoming Association of Sheriffs and Chiefs, rising in support of the bill. I hope at this point we, uh, our position is similar to what I hope the committee's derived at, that this is a very simple bill to allow for the governance of 911 within Wyoming within an existing framework that we have. And that is the Public Safety Communication uh, Commission. Um, there was, an, I know there was initial uh, confusion to start with that was thinking this we were putting this under the Public Service Commission, but this is an existing public safety communication system that we'll be adding to 
for the ability to apply for those federal funds on a statewide basis that we cannot apply for now. So that cost per citizen on the fee, uh, once you have this, these funds in place, then that's when you can accurately evaluate the need for an increase to those fees to cover additional features that we are not able to do as a result, even with the new funds from the federal government. So um, I think your question was right on point. The missed opportunity cost will be tremendous to the smallest state in the union with some of the largest expanse to cover with 911. These funds would greatly assist in that effort to uh, bring 911, keep it current, and take it to, as the bill says, the next generation. Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Questions for Mr. Odekoven, Senator French? Just a quick comment. I would uh, ask that the commission please work with the counties. I know we had an issue um, that uh, we couldn't get, as people get their cell phone in, a, in a, another state and they move to your county or your community, we couldn't get the accurate numbers from the carriers as to who was in the county and as to who we could charge the 75 cents per device because we knew we had more and more and more people moving into our community and the number of, like a better word, taxes on those devices was steadily going down and that, that just didn't match up. It's impossible to match that up. So I would hope that they would work with the, the communities. Madam Chair, that, that particular issue is an ongoing discussion. Uh, working with the carriers to be able to help identify as people have the ability to maintain their phone number from where they came, even though they live here, um, because the second companion issue um, that we first struggled with without diving off into a different discussion is the first problem was that phone number wanted to route that call to their home area if you dialed 911 rather than to the area to which they're in. So we've come past that point. And then the, the second half is that billing component to make sure that the fees are uh, derived within the community they re reside. So near and dear to our heart. Yes, sir. Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. I do see the Director of Homeland Security here, Ms. Bud. I know that you're going to receive a, a spot on this, this commission. Any comments? Uh, Madam Chairwoman Committee, uh, I'm Lynn Budd, the Director of the Office of Homeland Security. Um, yes, um, it, we are being added, or actually re-added uh, back into the Public Safety Communications Commission. We were removed from the commission in 2017 when we, uh, the administration of the Public Safety Communications Commission was moved to YDOT from our agency. Um, it is important. I would I would stand in support of that. Um, we do coordinate uh, with public safety communications all the time. In addition, historical grant funding within the 911 uh, grant funding that we're looking at uh, getting in the future uh, requires uh, coordination or actually um, uh, I can't working with the SafeCom guidance and SafeCom guidance requires. Um, the commission or the, or the uh, entity applying for the grant to work with the emergency management as well as homeland security agencies in the state. Questions for Director Bud? Pricing none, thank you. I know I called you up. Appreciate that. All right, further public comment? Seeing none, public comment is closed. Committee, back to you. Moved by Kolb, seconded by French. Discussion on the bill? Kolb? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in uh, my neck of the woods, uh, we, I'm in the largest county in the state of Wyoming, I believe seventh in the US. And it's always been a challenge trying to dispatch emergency services to folks in, in our really the most rural areas of our, of our particular area in my district. So I'm in favor of uh, this uh, hesitancy was funding, but I think it's something we have to do and we have to move forward. I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Kolb. Any additional comments? All right, roll call vote. Senator Cooper. Aye. Senator French. Aye. Senator Kolb. Aye. Senator Cost. Aye. Chairwoman Nethercott. Aye. Madam Chair, Senate File 41 passes with five ayes. All right, thank you. With that, we will go to Senate File 65, Electrical Safety Enforcement Amendments. Um, 
I know that the sponsor of this bill, Senator Salazar, is currently presenting another bill and another committee that's very important to him, the abortion bill over there. And so he will not be attending the presentation of his bill. Um, I did share with him that Senator Koss would go ahead and do that because uh, he indicated that Senator Koss likes this bill. And so <laughs> Senator Koss, um, that was your five second warning. <laughs> if you could go ahead and present this bill on his behalf. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Um, and uh, I, I think I want to start out by making sure that everybody understands a couple of things. First of all, safety is one of the most important things that we absolutely adhere to. And, and uh, even with the work that is being asked to be considered here, the safety of our people and the safety of the buildings that are constructed is extremely important. So I, I wanna make sure everybody understands that before we get into it, because we're not trying in any way, shape or form to lower safety, even though there may be some who disagree with that. Um, to start out, first of all, right now, the state statute uh, for electrical ins uh, inspections in municipalities says that you need to hire a master electrician to do those inspections. We're having some trouble in some areas getting a master electrician hired. Uh, part of that's because they can go out into the real world and make a whole lot more money than they can working for a municipality. And the other part of that is uh, a lot of some of the master electricians are starting to show their age and probably wanting to retire and take it a little easier. And it's a little more difficult to find them. We've got some cities such as Riverton and Cody and Dubois that are really struggling with this. This really hits our small towns much harder than it hits our larger towns because of the lack of ability to, number one, find somebody within the area that can take care of the inspections. And number two, and probably more importantly, when they try to get a hold of the state to get a master electrician to come, it takes an extremely long time for them to get there. So the movement is to say, OK, let's consider changing this a little bit. And maybe uh, that move will assist us in um, helping to cover the, what is needed. So. This is an act of fire protection and electrical safety amending requirements for the delegation of authority to municipalities and counties to enforce and inter interpret local or state fire building and electrical safety standards as specified as providing for an effective date. And um, basically what we're asking is the state fire marshal shall delegate complete authority to municipalities and counties which apply to enforce and interpret local or state fire building existing building standards or electrical safety standards which meet the requirements of this section. The state fire marshal shall notify the governing body of the municipality or county of the minimum standards and requirements of this act. Um, and that's with Wyoming Statute 166501 and Wyoming Statute 166502 and transfer jurisdiction and authority by letter, except as provided in Wyoming Statute 35.9.119.A.I. and subsection B of this section, nothing in this section affects the authority of the state fire marshal or chief electrical inspector regarding state owned or leased buildings. Local enforcement authority under this section shall be subject to the following requirements and certifications of inspectors. And what we're wanting to do is the code of enforcement authorities for fire and building codes is requested certification of a fire inspector or building inspector is applicable um, by the International Code Council, the ICC, uh, is required for any inspector employed or contracted after June 1, 2010 to enforce those codes for the municipality or county. And then we've on page three, if the code enforcement authority for the electrical code is requested certification of an electrical inspector by either the International Code Council or the International Association of Electrical Inspectors or licensing by the state as a journeyman or master electrician is required. Code enforcement authority for individual categories of residential electrical code provisions 
and commercial electrical code provisions may be individually requested and granted under this paragraph based on the corresponding types of certifications held. Uh, if the municipality or county that has been granted local enforcement authority under this subsection fails to maintain employment of an inspector holding the appropriate certification required by this subject section, enforcement authority previously granted under this subsection shall revert to the department 120 days after the last day the properly certified inspector has left the employment of the municipality or county, except that the chief electrical inspector may delay the revisions of enforcement authority to department for the specified time period not to exceed an additional 120 days upon a showing of a good cause by the municipality or county. So basically what we're wanting to do is say in that time period, as long as there's a good cause, uh, we're trying to use uh, what has been allowed by others. And then of course, going through the rest of the uh, page four, pretty much is holding except down at the bottom, it says if sole plan review authority is required, requested certification of uh, a building plans examiner by International Code Council. And then if code enforcement authorities for the fire, fire code or building code is requested certification of a fire inspector or building inspector as applicable by the International Code Council. And to, to read a little bit more as far as... Hold on, Senator Cost. You've done a great job. Senator Salazar would be proud. Time is 9.17. Okay. How many folks on Zoom would like to testify on this bill? Yeah. And how many folks in the room want to testify on this bill? All right, we will leave here at 945. Raise your hand if you're gonna testify on this bill. I need you to look around the room and identify, I want you to govern yourselves and I don't wanna to have to time limit you um, as to how this works and how many folks on Zoom? There are two, oh no, there are four. There are four people. Raise your hands again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are... There are eight people plus four on Zoom. That makes 12. We have 30 minutes. Senator Cost, I'd reserve your thoughts. Uh, with that, let's go to public comment on the bill. Let's start online. Mayor Hall, take a seat. Mr. Winnie, come on forward. Chairman Nethercott, uh, Bill Winnie, Sublet County. Uh, by way of background, I spent 30 years active duty in the Navy in the Navy Nuclear Propulsion Program, 44 months as a chief engineer on a nuclear sub. And when I built my house in uh, the Bondurant area, I wired my house. And I followed the state electrical codes, and which actually are the national electrical codes. I have one thought for you. There's a word in there in the bill where the local authorities could interpret the national electrical code. And I, I think you ought to think about that because I think the interpretation should probably remain at the state level. So you don't get into different versions of the electrical code. Subject to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Winnie. Appreciate it. All right, who do we? All right, who do we have online? Uh, Mr. Lemon, you can unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the committee. Welcome. Uh, yes, my name is Chad Lemon. I'm a journeyman electrician in the state of Wyoming. Um, just wanted to reach out. I don't believe reducing the the ability to inspect the the level of inspection that we need is going to help our state. Um, we've actually spoken with quite a few contractors. I've spoken to quite a few contractors, even in the Cody area. I'm from Cody, Wyoming. Um, spoken to all the contractors I know in person and they're against this. They don't understand where it came from necessarily. Um, uh, that's that's all I've got. I just, I, I don't think we should reduce 
the level of inspection that we're currently getting, we need to figure out how to work through this. Um, I, I work with a bunch of electricians in the area and we've talked to some of the retirees and there's a potential for possibly making, helping these municipalities by bringing in some retired uh, master electricians to help with this situation. Um, and that's really all I have for, uh, for comments at this point. I just don't think we should make our um, inspection less enforceable. You know, we don't need to go backwards. All right, thank you, Mr. Lemon. With that, let's go to Mr. Payne and then we're gonna bring up Mayor Hall. Good morning. I appreciate the time to testify on this uh, Senate file 65. Uh, I've been in the trade 31 years and could you introduce moved, yourself to the committee? You're Mr. Oh, Payne, Jerry Payne, and you're from where, yeah. Mr. Payne? I'm out of uh, Natrona County, bar none, Wyoming. All right, wonderful. Yeah. Welcome to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Thank you. I I echo what Chad said. I, I believe reducing or, or watering down the level of people that will be doing inspections, I think it's a wrong move. I think we can get together with the leaders in the industry and come up with a solution that will work um, again, uh, Chad also said it. There's there's some retirees, there's some master electricians that may be willing to come in part time and help out when there's a level of inspections that you guys can't meet. And I think we could work together and make this better and not go down the road route of Senate File 65. Mr. Payne, thank you. Thank you. Electricians can follow direction far much easier about being. <laughs> Being cognizant of time, thank you for respecting our time, Mr. Payne and Mr. Lemon. Appreciate you. Mayor Hall, if you'd come forward, please. And a, and a couple of explanation for my wisdom here in public comment. I know Mr. Winnie; he he knows how to do this in comments, so he's he he knows the process. Wanted to make sure we got some of our online commenters available so they don't get skipped over as we get into some of the meat of this testimony. And then Mayor Hall, I know um, some of the, the motivation for this bill comes out of your area, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, glad to hear more about that and welcome to Senate Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Matt Hall, Mayor of City of Cody. And I'm joined today by Tony Tolstead, the City Administrator from Riverton and Mayor Guard, the uh, Mayor of Riverton. They actually drove down this morning. So we appreciate that you gave us a chance to hear this bill. Tricky, Mayor Hall, very tricky. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, County 10. So I, I too have had a lot of discussions with our local contractors, um, our obviously our planners, administrators, and and like everyone in the room and like our, our, our fire department, our firefighters, our fire marshals, our number one priority with all of this is public safety. You know, we are trying to basically solve or come up with a solution for our problem here that we cannot find, we cannot hire. We've, we've went out, we've asked to try and replace these positions with master electricians from our community. And they are too busy doing what they're doing and doing a good job of making money. And, and so I don't fault them for sure for coming not or not wanting to come work for the city you know, in order just to do our inspection process. I have actually talked specifically to a couple of electrician contractors in the city of Cody. And the one thing that they can agree on for sure is the value of having a second set of eyes on these projects. Our, our local city electrical inspectors work hand in hand with these master electricians as they go through to just double check that the electrician's work is done properly. And that is the priority with those. We, um, in an attempt to try and figure out a way to solve this problem, have, uh, have come up with at least a solution to allow for a little flexibility for our municipalities to hire. So it's not quite so strict about having to have a master electrician in place. And one of the just, and I wanna turn it over to my two gentlemen here that are peers that are joining me really quick, but one of the electrical contractors that I talked to recently, he said, right now we are, are contracting with the city of Powell and we have one day a week that that 
electrical inspector can come over. And so all of the inspection has to take place during that day. And if they don't get to it, then a full week goes by. It's February. Our construction and permitting processes for the city of Cody go up at least 10 times from now to the summertime. So we're in a pretty difficult situation that we need to try and get this solved soon before our construction industry really gets worked up for this summer. And of course that translates to the timing, housing, housing costs. And so we wanna try and work with whoever we have to to try and come up with a solution for this, but we'll stand for questions, but I'd like to turn it over to my two colleagues. Mayor Gard, welcome. Uh, Madam Chair, Nevin Lecoq, we're glad to be here. We did leave early this morning, about three in the morning to, to come down. And uh, we appreciate the few minutes that, that you have to address our problem. Um, we don't have the volume of electrical work that uh, we would like to have. And so uh, this is an un unmandated uh, cost to the city of Riverton. And, and we are the biggest um, municipality in, the, in Fremont County. So my fellow mayors are, are perplexed on how they get past these rules and how they hire a, a master electrician to, to uh, sit in place waiting for an electrical inspection to take place. It's also a double um, application of, of what the state statutes are, in my opinion. All of our electricians are licensed through the state, masters and journeymen. And then they want to have us hire another independent individual to come back through and check that work. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know of any outstanding electrical problems with any of our, our electrical contractors in Fremont County. And so my thought that would save everyone money would be that if there's a problem that that would be reported to the state and then the state could take a look at those individuals who may be not doing work sufficient to the quality that they would like to have done. That wouldn't have to be done on an immediately uh, basis, but they could work their way to that problem and, and solve that and, and encourage those individuals to do better work. But right now it, uh, it places a great burden on us to find somebody that fits that category that we can go out and hire. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mayor Gard. Please introduce yourself to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. My name is Tony Tallstown, the city administrator of Riverton. <clears throat> Um, the, the item that I would speak to mostly is that we, we've talked a lot about safety and how it is our primary concern and we have no, there's nothing I would tell you different. Um, the items that are proposed to you as a part of the change have everything to do with making sure that those individuals that are actually doing the inspections have training. That is what we're doing, but the ability to find the master electricians as uh, has been already denoted to you is significantly difficult. While I understand that there may be individuals retiring, uh, that's not, and they may wanna spend some time here or there doing that. That's relying on a maybe and uh, trying to make sure that our industries continue to move forward, that those safety inspections are done in a timely manner so our buildings can get built. We all know the length of time that we can build in Wyoming. Um, and what we're trying to do is make progress without sacrificing safety. We're trying to, if you look through that, if you look through those trainings, you'll notice that there are, that, that those are directed specifically at the different, at the safety aspects of the work being done. It gives us the ability to staff those as Mayor Hall has pointed out, trying to find individuals or come up with the program or have individuals available on a contract basis, create significant barriers to our development as communities. Any consideration that you would give towards this, I don't wanna waste your time, but I did wanna bring up that safety is our concern and that the fact that hiring is so completely upside down, and I'm sure everybody understands that in the state and in the nation, what we wanna do is move our industries forward safely. And I think that this bill helps you do that better. Anyway, thank you for your time, Madam Chairman and Senators. Thank you, Administrator Tolstead. Uh, questions for the mayors, the administrator? Senator Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can one of you gentlemen tell me, is there anything in statute that prevents you from using a contract employer to do this? 
you're all trying talking about hiring a, a W-2 employee is what I'm hearing, but shouldn't this be able to be handled with a 1099 type employee? Madam Chairwoman. Yes. Um, Senator, it is our understanding that uh, that is part of the possibility that we could use. However, it also gets into the idea of using existing contractors that are that are in place. So uh, existing electricians to inspect other work within the community for their competitors. And that creates an environment that may not be desirable as we look forward. So if one individual is a contractor and is inspecting the next person, and we can imagine the next person that the next, the challenges that, that would create. However, as far as we understand, is it allowable to do that? That's our understanding. Oh, mm -hmm. there's, thank you, Madam Chair. There's not a, a group or an individual out there who's willing to just take this on as a, as a contract inspector and go from city to city. You haven't, Found somebody like that? Mayors? So we have, for sure, the city code has tried to reach out and advertise this to see if there is any availability for people that have the expertise. And we have not come up with anyone that is surfaced to, to, um, to take that, fill that seat. Um, it is, like I pointed out earlier, the the fluidity of the construction industry, particularly in the summertime, goes up considerably. And so having someone local in that, in that capacity to do those electrical inspections would be highly beneficial in order to keep their construction going forward so we don't run behind and, and uh, cost money with that. Senator Kolb. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I guess I would uh, first like to ask the question, are any of the people here in front of us considered experts in the field in contracting or have contracting experience in the electrical field? And to the people up that were at the panel now, I'd just like to ask that general question first. Mayor Gard? Yes, uh, Chairwoman Nebricott um, and Senator, I am a general contractor by trade, not an electrical contractor, but I work with many uh, electricians over the years. Um, this is a really deep subject and very difficult to cover on your time schedule. And there is real problems with this and uh, costly to municipalities uh, mandated by the state, no home rule availability for this. And, um, and as, if there was a contracted effort here, um, why does the state not take that responsibility and send out that inspector on a timely basis, not on in, in how they, they choose to, to fulfill that. And I don't disagree with that. We have a problem with inspections happening in a timely manner from the state when requested, that's another issue. But to reiterate my question, does anyone here have any electrical credentials, licensed electrician, even a, I guess an apprentice? a journeyman, a master to talk about this because I've heard we're all concerned about public safety and we should be. But what I also hear is, is there's no connection, no nexus between knowledge and the statement that we wanna change something in current state statute. And I appreciate the predicament we're in here with getting a timely inspection if that's the case. But no one I've heard yet has testified as an expert in this field, but yet we wanna make changes to a field that we have no expertise in. And I'm concerned and I am concerned about safety. And I find it, you know, I'll, I'll further comment, but I'll hold, I'll hold it back for now. I just wanted to hear if anyone here had particular expertise, not a general contractor or a plumber or a tinner, but as electrician, that was my question, thank you. Chairwoman Never the God. I we have expertise as mayors to pay for what you have raised your hand and mandated as the Senate onto our municipalities. So if you want to send us some money to pay for that, we'll be glad to do whatever you tell us to. But we don't have any money to do that with. And and to suggest that we have no expertise here sitting in front of you, I think is a we had the expertise to leave five hours ago 
at three in the morning to come down and testify. This is a difficult thing for us to find people to fill these positions. Thank you. Follow up, Senator Cole. It's nothing personal. I, I realize you're managers uh, of a city uh, in, in many cases and trying to do the best job you can. My question was quite specific about expertise in a particular field. Nothing more. It wasn't, uh, shouldn't be considered anything else. I'm trying to get to the bottom of what's going on and why I, I think I understand. I have a, I'm learning more as I'm listening. Uh, and I, that's what I'll finish with. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator. Further questions for the mayors? All right. Stay close. Thank you. All right. Further public comment? Is the state here? Come on forward. Welcome. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee. My name is Mike Reed. I'm the Wyoming State Fire Marshal and the Director of the Fire Prevention Electrical Safety um, Division. Uh, to my right is Mark Young, the Deputy Director and Assistant State Fire Marshal. Um, if I could open just with a comment um, uh, concerning, I guess, some of the comments. It's difficult to know where to start on this bill uh, uh, with, uh, with concerns and, and then addressing some of the comments that have been made. Um, but I think I'd like to start with one general observation, and that is that the thing that we keep hearing here is that the communities must have master electricians as their inspectors. And that's not quite accurate. The, the accurate uh, comment would be that they can hire journeyman electrician and train them as inspectors, but with the caveat that they don't ask for the jurisdiction over state buildings, because it's the, it's the key of state buildings that uh, puts into play the requirement for a master electrician. Um, and, and so I just wanted to lead with that. And so that expands the marketability, I guess, for this position considerably. Secondly, if, if I have time, uh, Madam Chairwoman, um, the major concern that we have, uh, most of the language is consistent with state statute at this time. I and mean, we are, we are uh, required to assign AHJs or the authority having jurisdiction to locations that meet the requirements and that ask for them. If they don't want to have that, then the state uh, assumes that responsibility. And, and along with that, um, they can also um, uh, refer it back to the state if they're having difficulties with the hiring of a journeyman inspector or someone else to meet their needs. And then we would gladly assume that. Um, and, and so I think there's a little confusion on that. Our major concern, Madam Chairwoman, with this bill is that it moves us from the requirement of a journeyman electrician as an inspector or a master electrician as an inspector if you also want AHJ on state buildings. It moves us into an ICC certified in electrical inspector. And an ICC, when you look at the requirements for an ICC certified electrical inspector, it requires approximately a one to two week online course the age of 18, and an open book test. I can do this. Yeah. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> Plan B. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so our concern is that we will have, at, at the bottom of the scale, we would have an 18-year-old that passed an open book one or two week course actually advising master electricians with thousands upon thousands of hours of expertise on how to do their job. I don't think that most master electricians are gonna find that to be a tenable situation. On another side of the issue, the same individual would have the legal authority to stop construction projects. 
if things weren't being done according to what they wanted them to be done as. Now, our inspectors are masters. In fact, all of our inspectors are master electricians. And, and they have a series of uh, steps that they have to go through before we would even consider shutting down a, a, a construction project. And so we have those checks and balances that are in place. And, 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 I, and I know we're really tight on our time here today, but, but those are our concerns. Um, uh, the, the level of uh, training that the, ins the inspector would not have to have and, and, and uh, considering uh, the uh, construction project uh, issue. Oh, someone today said that uh, electrical uh, inspections are, are, are that electrical installations are not a problem. And I, I thought I would just point out that since 2017 to 2021, uh, electrical malfunctions of some nature have been the number one cause of fires in the state of Wyoming. 2017, it was number one, 18, number one, 19, it was number two, uh, and, and uh, heating uh, was uh, number one, and then 20 and 21, it was the number one issue. Now, that's with master electricians in an inspector's uh, role, and so I can't imagine if we reduce the uh, requirement down to this one-week course, what impact that would have. And then, in, in, I guess I'll close and answer any questions that you may have. But I, I had a thought last night as I was trying to go to sleep, and that is, um, agreed. There is an issue with uh, with hiring electricians to be inspectors. Uh, we're not having that big of a difficult time. I mean, we have all master electricians. Of course, we'd love to have some more uh, out there doing the job. But to solve the problem. Uh, let's say with a teacher shortage, we don't reduce the educational requirements of the teacher. Nursing shortages, we don't reduce the uh, requirements for the nursing uh, staff. We, we value those positions, and I think we should approach the uh, electrical inspectors with the same uh, uh, sort of, uh, of handling. And so with that, I think I'll just stop uh, talking and uh, answer any questions you may have. Mr. Reed, thank you. What I do intend to do um, committee members is to allow the mayors a chance to respond to that because I think it's important for us to hear that response in light of some of the explanation provided by Mr. Reed. Mayors, would you like to do that or, or no? Just want to give you that opportunity. So stay close, stay in the front row. Come on up. Um, and with that, Mr. Mr. Young, would you like to provide any follow-up comments? No, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I have no other comments. Um, Director Reed has covered it well. Thank you. All right, questions from the committee of State Fire Marshal. All right, seeing none. And, and just feel free to, um, would you like to provide any response right now to the State Fire Marshal? Um, okay, to the mayor. Sure. Okay. Come close to the mic sure. and turn that <laughs> mic on because there's lots of folks watching online. So the process works where it's, it's hand in hand. Um, and as far as the hiring process goes, is that Mr. Reed alluded to, <laughs> I, our hiring process at the city is pretty extra, extenuous in order to try and find people that actually have experience. To Senator Colton's point, we aren't experts in all these things. So we try and go out into the field and find people that can be experts. We would, I can only speak for my own municipality, but we certainly wouldn't hire somebody 18 years old with no experience in any kind of trade field to start to go take a test. Maybe they were a lawyer or to, do, to go take a test and decide to switch fields and, uh, and to be an electrical inspector to work with these people. Furthermore, the people that they work with hand in hand would certainly let us know about the er error we've made and that we would go ahead and take care of that problem. To the point of what the state Marsh fire marshal mentioned of the electrical journeyman being an option that's not being considered for non-state buildings, were you aware of that before and that's not a solution here? And that's because of the competition piece, I'm assuming? 
Mayor Hall. Uh, Senator Nellicott, sorry, Chairman. Um, I was not totally aware, at least, of the language that says specifically. Um, that's partly why I brought my two peers with me to try and answer those. They are a little bit, at least Mr. Tolsta is a little bit more in the hiring process. And Mayor Guard, and then we're gonna to go to Senator we, Cole. We just have, and we're past, or we're right on your time limit. Thank you. We, we do have a problem finding that individual to hire. And so it makes it difficult every time we squeeze down those requirements, just like we find it's difficult to hire a phase three water uh, position or phase four. And, and we're mandated to find those people and it makes it extremely difficult to do this. These electricians that are in our community are already licensed by the state of Wyoming and, and they should be able to do their own work. Senator Kolb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this goes to probably Mayor Paul, uh, your, your, your statement about what you wouldn't do. I understand that, but more to the point you could, if this, if this proposed bill became law, you could do exactly what you said you wouldn't do, but you could do it. My point is, is that uh, the law is written for everybody, uh, not just, you know, your administration or the, you know, or somebody else's administration. It's written for everybody. So these laws have to be taken as what they could be, not what you wouldn't do. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that, what you said, but we got to look at what the law says. And I think you'd agree the law would allow you to do exactly what you said you wouldn't do. But I, I understand. Just wanted to make that clear. All right, final questions for the mayors or the state fire marshal. Quick question for you both. There's the opportunity, um, and, and I'm not suggesting it, but asking um, whether or not this would be an appropriate for an interim topic, which would allow the committee or another committee of the legislature to review this concern and study it over the interim and have more opportunity for robust conversation, understanding the issues from both parties and, and potentially working out a solution. Would, would that be something you're interested in? Mayor Hall says no, Mayor Guard. I, I would be very interested in that. The, the fact of the legislation that's passed, and it's easy to come into the legislature and say, um, who's against health and safety? Nobody's going to raise their hand. Who's for it? Everybody's going to raise their hand. As it comes down to cost, how do we build effectively and moderate homes at a, at a point that is able to be built in the state of Wyoming? We need that long conversation. Um, it, it needs to be well spoken of and, and brought to the attention of how do we do this in our rural locations. Thank uh, you. Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, and in regards to the interim topic, I think with the uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020 records uh, on hand, maybe that interim topic could answer some other questions too, because it sounds like maybe we're not being effective with the master electricians even for these fires. So maybe there's more to this than that, and we need to really look at it. Senator Cole. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it goes to uh, Mr. Reed. Uh, in particular, I guess uh, your opinion, if this bill was to become law, would we in fact be more safe or less safe when it came to uh, electrical issues? And Madam Chairwoman, Mr. Uh, another cut, uh, less safe. That's my trial lawyer over here to the left. <laughs> I'm being trained. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for being here. Final public comment. Okay. Um, yeah, please come forward. Everyone raise your hand if you want to provide public comment. Anyone else on the waiting room online? There's two. Each of you will have one minute. Um, Madam Chair, Tammy Johnson with Wyoming State AFL-CIO. We did bring um, work with the IBEW and bring a solution that might be amenable. Would be great to pursue that. I think the idea of an interim topic is, is fabulous. IBEW supports that and like to see some resolution to this that would be helpful to communities and to um, the safety of the people who live in the state so thank you thank yeah. you so much thanks for respecting our time not a gun bill that's what happens all right wonderful please come forward
My name is Shad Cooper. I'm the fire chief for Sublet County Unified Fire. Um, I'm here speaking on behalf of the Wyoming Fire Chiefs Association. We just like to express our opposition to this bill. Um, as as uh, Director Reed had, had indicated, uh, fire uh, causes in the state um, uh, drive drive public safety, and uh, we want to make sure that we reduce the causes of fire, um, specifically from electrical installations. And so we oppose this as as presented. Thank you. Did you drive up from Pydale? I'm here all week. Um, okay. Yes. All right. Great. All right. Thank you for being here, Mr. Reddy. And if we could bring in the folks online so that there's no delay. Thank you, uh, Chairman Nettercott, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Kevin Reddy. I'm the president of the Federated Firefighters of Wyoming. Uh, we represent nine IFF locals across the state. We protect more than half of the state's population. And uh, we strongly oppose this bill uh, based on the reduction in uh, safety. And as a matter of note, when electrical malfunctions occur, we're going into these hazardous environments to put the fires out. So that's our stance. Thank you, Mr. Reddy. All right, online we have um, Mr. Holder. Yes, Madam Chairman, uh, I'm James Holder. I've been in electrical trade for 29 years and have been on the Wyoming Electrical uh, Wyoming State Electrical Board for around 18 years. And I strongly oppose this bill to inadequate uh, on-the-job training and education that is already required by the state. The industry is always changing, and uh, we, the state also requires 16 hours of continuing education uh, to improve upon that license and education. And uh, looking up an ICC test, which I have taken one, you can get online and uh, pass it pretty quickly. Uh, but it, we need the, the knowledge on the job. I need to be double checked. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holder. And Ms. Allred, if you can please provide your first and last name and, and who you're with and where you're from. Thank you. My name is Jane Allred and I live here in Cheyenne. And I am the Chief Electrical Inspector with the State of Wyoming Fire Marshal's Office. And I can tell you that I've had 40 years experience in this field as an electrician, a contractor, and an inspector. And there are other options for municipalities to hire electricians through contract. They can talk to the city of Ammon in Idaho. They do it. They can talk to the city of Laramie here in, in Wyoming. They do it as well and see how it's working for them. But as far as I know, it's worked well. But you cannot ask someone who has never installed electrical ever to tell someone with many years of experience how to install. And it is not safe. We are not promoting safety, but we are decreasing the safety involved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Allred. Again, I wanna thank everyone who provided public comment this morning for being very respectful of the committee's time. Greatly appreciated. Uh, with that, good senators, one thought I have is that there seems to be some support for an interim topic. What I would ask due to our time is if there's a motion on the bill, you please make that. Or if one of you is interested in committing to submit this as an interim topic, uh, I'm, I'm sure the stakeholders would appreciate that. So with that, I'd open it up to the committee. Public comment is closed. Sure. Senator Kolb. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I would certainly be interested in uh, working on an interim topic. Um, I will say that uh, being a citizen legislative body, I bring unique uh, abilities and expertise to this particular subject. Uh, I have been a master for 38 years, four years before that a journeyman. And I was uh, enslaved by my father as an apprentice from the ages of 13 to 18. So I've got a long history in the electrical field. And, and it's hard to convey that to my co-legislators uh, at any level because of what I've learned over the years. And I've been a contractor for many, many years. Uh, I will assure you that this is decreasing safety. Uh, I, uncategorically, it's decreasing safety for many, many reasons that I don't want to belabor. Uh, so I, I, I'm glad to be here. I finally found something I, I really, really uh, understand and know and, and have lived and uh, appreciate. Uh, and so I would, I would support interim topic, Madam Co-Chair, uh, Chairman. And uh, I think it needs to be talked about more. I think we need to know what's going on with the state. I think maybe it needs more flexibility, but by no means decreasing the qualifications for people that do inspections. And because it isn't, I just want to point out one fact. 
It isn't about the masters you're inspecting. No, no, no. It's about the journeyman you're inspecting. It's about the apprentices under said journeyman. That indeed is the liability. So as generally masters to masters, everybody understands generally, you know, we get, you get caught on things and things are changing, but it's the people underneath the master because the masters aren't the ones out there doing all the work. They're just, the, you know, the top of the pyramid. So we got to watch everything for the sake of public safety, buildings, libraries, hospitals, uh, critical life safety support. These are things that people in the trade don't know about. And uh, we can agree to disagree that, you know, we have a difference of opinion, but it is about public safety. And I will never support something that lessens public safety when it's a clear issue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Further comments from the committee, or is there a motion? Senator Cost would like to move the bill. Is there a second? No. Okay. I was going to move that we move it to an interim topic. I think Senator Kolb also supported that. Um, there's no motion for that. It would be one of you commits to work with the stakeholders to submit that as an interim topic. They cannot submit an interim topic without a legislator. And so um, Senator Kolb, I think, has agreed to do that. Senator Kosh, you will do that with him. And then what I would encourage the Joint Judiciary Committee to do, the Senate Judiciary Committee to do when we meet as a joint uh, committee to determine our interim topics in just a few weeks, um, that you support that initiative on behalf of your fellow Senate Judiciary Committee members. And we'll get this moved into an interim topic. I look forward to hearing from you all then and continuing to maybe hear a solution that you've all worked out without a legislative solution. So thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for driving up from Riverton. Drive safely home. Those roads are terrible. Maybe stay, spend some time here in your capital city. Um, great to see you.